All right, hey, uh, guys, it is, it's, uh, we have a special weekend here at River of Life. It is Adult and Teen Challenge weekend here at River, yeah. Adult and Teen Challenge, a big uh, round of applause. Uh, we love what they do, and, uh, and God is just moving in the ladies over there. And, um, and we're thankful that we get to hear about that and kind of hear what God's doing uh, today. And so uh, in, a, in a little bit, we're going to hear some of their testimonies. And then uh, the director of the Missoula Campus of Adult and Teen Challenge is our very own Jamie Rindall. And she's going to come up and, and share with us. All right. But first, if you don't know anything about Adult and Teen Challenge, here's a video to, to fill you in. In 1958, David Wilkerson traveled to New York City to preach the gospel to teenage gangs. He quickly recognized that drug and alcohol addiction was consuming the lives of the youth. Adult and Teen Challenge was founded to address the growing addiction epidemic. And today the need is greater than ever, and everything we do always comes back to our primary mission, to make disciples. We want to put hope within reach of every addict. In 1983, Mike Hodges opened the first campus in Oregon, and now the Adult and Teen Challenge Pacific Northwest Family of Ministries has expanded to five states throughout the region. For the last four decades, we have been growing and refining our approach to the discipleship process. We recognize that people need more than just sobriety. They need every area of their life to be transformed by the gospel. So we offer a comprehensive approach to recovery. At the core of our ministry is our residential recovery program. When students walk through our doors, they meet Jesus. And when they meet Jesus, the transformation process begins. Within the structure of a campus and in the community of peers and our staff, they develop spiritual disciplines. They learn how to pray, how to study scripture, how to worship, and how to be lifelong disciples of Christ. And as their faith grows, they find freedom. It's a sanctuary. It's a place to check out from this craziness of this world and not have all the pressures of responsibilities, but just one thing in mind, establishing a relationship with the Lord. Addiction creates complex behavioral health challenges, so we have integrated Life Renewal to provide state-approved counseling by our own professionally trained addiction counselors. Our students participate in individual and group therapy, and our counselors equip them with the tools they need to heal from their past and apply biblical principles to their lifelong recovery. I think the most important thing that Life Renewal does is it really helps to change the hearts and minds of our students. It gives them tools to change the, the thoughts that they had and really bring new perspective into who they can become. We were designed to work, created to be productive. So our vocational training program helps our students establish the skills needed to be productive members of our society. Our thrift stores, work crews, and other vocational experiences teach important life skills, teamwork, leadership, stewardship, and integrity. We help students discover the joy of an honest day's work. And rather than sitting on the sidelines during their recovery, they build confidence as they put their new skills into practice. Um, Students in our program, they come in, some have never had jobs before. Again, it's a bio part of our comprehensive approach and it's geared to helping them become successful outside of our program when they graduate. Discipleship is not just about learning the gospel, but also living it out. David Wilkerson founded this ministry on outreach. So Hope Outreach gives our students the opportunity to discover the joy of serving, to give back to their community, and to deliver hope beyond our campus walls. We work with local partners to bring compassion to our communities. Our students share their stories to bring prevention and awareness to local schools. And we share the hope we have found in Christ through evangelism. Outreach is not only one quarter of our comprehensive approach, it's also one of our core values. And as a ministry, we're committed to impacting our community. At Adult and Teen Challenge, our comprehensive approach to recovery is allowing us to broaden our reach and improve outcomes for our students. Our comprehensive approach helps us put hope within reach of every addict and make lifelong disciples. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. A really cool thing to see someone being um, given that opportunity to experience hope for the first time 
and everything about them begins to change. Adult and Teen Challenge changed my life. I was able to finally learn how to surrender my life fully to the Lord and have maintained complete sobriety since then. I am a story of hope and redemption. Our kids have a, have a more promising future because we went through the program. We went through the hard work of breaking those chains of addiction and, and through the power of Jesus, it was possible. It makes me tear high of, of joy and happiness of how beautiful our God is. It's Him. Good morning, River of Life. I'm so glad you chose to come to church this morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jamie Rindall, and uh, I'm the director of Adult and Teen Challenge here in Missoula, and I'm also one of the members and church family here at River of Life. So I'm so glad to be here with you this morning and share a little bit about Adult and Teen Challenge and about what God is doing in the amazing lives of the women here. And so before we go any further, I want you all to know that we have all of our students that are in our program here we have a graduate in the house, too. Hi, Miss Chevy. Uh, we got our interns here, and she took me off guard there. I haven't seen her beautiful face for a second, so I got a little, a little excited there. And the women are here with us, and so we're just, I'm really glad that you can join us and learn about what we're doing. And before we get into anywhere farther, there's some really exciting things that are happening at our campus, and God just continues to uh, speak and open up doors and make ways that are so far beyond my wildest dreams and expectations. And so I'd like to show you just a snippet about what's going on here real quick. Um, do we have that picture? Okay. We are under contract for a new piece of property. Uh, what we currently have is in the orange, and we currently um, own 2.5 acres with our center that can hold 24 women and all of our program offices, um, and we are fully debt-free in that property, and God made a way for us to go under contract for the Teal property, which is right next door, another two and a half acres, uh, where we'll be able to move our program offices, increase capacity by 40%, take on women with children children, add some transitional housing for, yeah. It's so exciting. We're going to add some, um, what we call phase five, which is if you're not called to be a second year, which is our internship, but you still need some help, you're not ready to go back into the community, this is an opportunity for you to gain some stability, we'll help you get a job, and really just continue to journey with you, because this is a hard road, and yet these are the strongest women that I get the opportunity to spend days with. They are just beyond strong. If you don't know them, you need to get to know them. <laughs> So that's what's happening at Adult and Teen Challenge, and uh, it's just bigger than I ever anticipated when I answered the call that the Lord put on my heart to become the director, and, and yet he just keeps telling us to keep walking one foot in front of the other, so we will, and there's an opportunity to partner with us for that, and there will be more information back at the, at the Welcome Center, uh, our, <laughs> not River of Life's Welcome Center, our table back in the back if you're interested in learning more, but have you ever done anything in your life where um, you just felt like wrecked, pretty embarrassed, and a little defeated in the moment where you're like, I just... I'm not sure how I'm going to recover from what just happened. Anybody out there? A couple of you? Okay, well, I have multiple times. I seem to get myself in these situations more times than I'd like to, to even think about. But there was this one time back in 2016, I was recently pregnant with our son Leif. And I used to meet potential clients and business partners at Cafe Dolce on Brooks. And if you've never been there, it's a big, beautiful building and it's cement floor and big cathedral ceilings. And, and this fateful morning when I walked in, there was no seats available. It was standing room only at the time. And so I waited my time and then I got a table and I went amongst my routine, which was setting the table grabbing water glasses, utensils, so that when the person that was coming to meet me felt that I was prepared for their arrival. So I'd gone about my day just like I always did, and I went and grabbed a glass for my, the lady that was coming, and I went to grab the glass. They were stacked like a pyramid, and when I went to grab the glass, the glass hit 
the glass behind that glass. And then they just proceeded to tink, 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 tink into the bottom of like a three foot tall vase that was filled with water and marbles and lilies. And at, as the, these, this pyramid of glasses hit the bottom of this vase, they shattered and went all over the Cafe Dolce floor. And at that time, I happened to be the only person standing everyone else was sitting. And the only thing I knew to do was to get down on the ground and start cleaning up because I had made this mess. So I quickly got to the ground and started swooping up the glass and the marbles and trying to get the water. And the owner comes behind me and he was like, ma'am, I really need you to not do that. And I was like, no, you don't understand. Like I have to clean up my mess. I'm a rule follower. I made a mess. This is terrible. Everyone's watching me. And he's like, I really need you to be done. You need to be done. So I got up and I walked to my table and the lady came and I said, you'll never guess what happened. I can never come back here and show my face. And what seemed like an absolute entire, like my entire life in that moment was probably only about five minutes. And I tell you that story because in America, one American dies about every five minutes from drug overdose. So what felt like my life in that moment actually is somebody's life from drug overdose. Each day in the United States, more than 130 people die as a result of an overdose. And last year, so 2023 in Montana, there were 969 opioid-related 911 response calls that happened in the state of Montana. So that's not, um, I brought my friend to the hospital. That's not, I just made it through on my own or something like that. Those are just 911 calls related to opioid overdose related calls in Montana. And those numbers are, are skyrocketing with the um, epidemic of fentanyl. It is just decimating our communities. These numbers that I just shared with you, they don't include the side effects of drug abuse like broken families, broken marriages, abused children, loss of public resources, and so on. The cost of addiction is very high. But... We are here today to talk about a God that is bigger than all of this. A God who, when called upon, is willing to heal and restore everyone who has been hurt by drug abuse. The world will say once a drug addict, always a drug addict, but we believe differently. Teen Challenge stands on 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. The book of truth says in this verse, we become new in a relationship with Jesus. Currently, however, we live in a world full of chaos with people demanding all things of different things to make things right. If only they would just take the, the steps towards a relationship with Jesus, we believe all those points of demand would begin to not matter anymore. Today, you're going to hear from two women through our program that are going to talk about their testimony and what their relationship with the Lord can do and has done. These two women and the other women in our group that you'll hear from have come through the dark into the light and are here to share this with you today. We'd like to relate today's presentation to this verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, these women would not be able to share with you today. Courtney? Hi, guys. So I'm Courtney. I am 24 years old. And I grew up in a good Christian home and learned how to serve the Lord. I have a sister who is my best friend and is a year younger than I. And three other siblings, which are all about 15-ish years younger. My family was always close-knit. But when my brothers were born and had special needs, that changed. Chaos and drama erupted in the once peaceful and quiet home. And my parents fought a lot trying to figure out how to parent my brothers. Um, so my sister and I learned to ignore them just by going into our bedroom and such, just to stay out of their way. I wanted nothing to do with my parents, so I stayed away from the house as much as I could. When my sister got married, I felt a part of me fall away. I had lost my best friend, and I felt rejected and forgotten by her. So I turned to alcohol, men, and toxic friends to fill that void. 
My self-destructive road started at the age of 19 when I was first introduced to pot, which eventually led me to alcohol. And since I was underage, I turned to friends that were over 21 to buy it for me. I was staying out late at parties, constantly lying to my family about where I was, what I was doing, and who I was with. I was losing my family's trust. On Easter morning of 2021, I blacked out at the wheel from drinking too much at the bar. And in my attempts to drive home, I hit a telephone pole going about about 80 miles an hour, completely totaling my car. I walked away from that accident with only bruised knuckles, even though the airbags didn't deploy. And by the grace of God, I didn't get a DUI. The Lord had his hand on me through that, but even that wouldn't be enough to make me see that I had a problem. Every day I was fighting with my family because they were concerned about me. I didn't want to efface and accept that I needed help. I thought that I was too far gone to be helped and didn't care what happened to me at this point in life. I just wanted the pain to stop. I started drinking heavier to build up my tolerance because I was made fun of for not being able to keep up and it only made my world hurt more. The months went by, and I continued to drink and drive with my second car. I was spending the night at friends' houses in town because I would get too drunk to drive home. I continued to spiral out of control, and before my 23rd birthday, I was sexually assaulted several times and learned how to stuff it all down and felt it was all my fault. Fall of 2022 came around, and I put my second car in a ditch from drunk driving. God had his hand on me in this accident like the first one. Airbags didn't deploy again, and my truck almost went down a steep embankment, but it tipped over and was stopped by a tree. And again, no DUI. At this point, I knew I had an addiction, but I didn't know where to go or what to do. Part of me was glad I didn't die in my accidents, but I also secretly wished I had because I was known as the family drunk, so I was ashamed to be around my family, but I was also known as the fam- the drunk in my brother-in-law's family. They couldn't possibly love me, so why bother being around? I felt like a burden to them all. Um, I made the decision to come to Adult and Teen Challenge in December of 2022, and I can truly say that my family has always loved and cared for me, but I was too blinded by my addiction, and they were scared for my life not knowing if I was going to come home at night or if they were going to get a phone call saying I was dead somewhere. Romans 6, 11 through 14 says, "'Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body,' to make you obey its passions. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but grace." I am now learning who true friends are. I know who I am without alcohol. I don't need it. My past does not define me. I am restoring my relationships with my family. Um, I was never a burden to them. And they're happy to see me doing well. I have now completed the program of Adult and Teen Challenge and I am five and a half months into my internship. Yeah, (laughs) Um, but I'm five and a half months into my internship for Adult and Teen Challenge. Um, And just most importantly, I'm learning how to be the woman the Lord created me to be. Thank you. Well done, Miss Courtney. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you don't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Lindsay.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Lindsay. My struggle with self-love and self-identity started as a child. I never felt I added up to my sisters and started rebelling for my dad's love and attention. Being molested by a neighbor at a young age started my struggles with self-identity and had me searching for what I thought was love in all the wrong places. I learned how to lie and manipulate any situation to get what I wanted and to fill the void I was running from. My freshman year of high school, my best friend would kill himself, and I would see his body being covered by the blue tarp from the police. A blood stain left on the ground from when they finally removed his body is all that was left. My life was in complete shambles after that, and the drug use and drinking took a whole new level. I failed my freshman year of high school because the loss of my friend cut so deep. Bigger secrets and bigger lies consumed my life and my mind, and convinced I had no one to turn to, and the constant anxiety, loneliness, and depression became unbearable. By the time I was 21, I had a full-blown addiction to meth, opiates, and sex. I would attempt suicide for the first time at 22 because I could no longer handle the mess of the life I had created. My high school boyfriend and I, who have been on and off for 14 years, would get pregnant for the first time my senior year, but unfortunately, we would miscarry that baby. But eventually, we would have our miracle child. Unfortunately, the stronghold that addiction had on both of us would land him in the federal prison system for 10 years, and me with my world, my son, being taken away from me for his safety, because I was no longer safe for my child. I would be given visitation with him, and having to leave every time installed a fear inside of me, inside of him, that mommy was never coming back. I'll never forget the sounds of his screams when I would leave again. There's no coming back from that pain that's deep in your soul. One morning, waking up, not being able to walk or move my body because I had endocarditis, which is a staph infection of the heart, did not stop me from getting drugs delivered to the hospital to continue shooting up. I was stabbed by a dirty needle from an angry boyfriend, and I contracted hep C, which my body had a reaction to and almost sent me into liver failure. But neither of these would slow me down or make me fear for my life ending. Fentanyl and meth were all I cared about, and nothing would stop me from getting it. All the sexual, mental, emotional, and physical abuse just came with the lifestyle, and I thought that was just how normal people lived out their lives. Watching my friend be scalped from a gun by people robbing me at gunpoint, then turning around myself and robbing stores and people. This was the only way I knew how to live, and I was convinced there was no help for me. And the stronghold fentanyl had on me would eventually kill me. It was what I lived for, and it was my idol. Many jail stays, multiple treatments, and any other attempt to get sober would fail me. Romans 7.15 says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And that would sum up the last 19 years of my life. But God. <laughs> God would have another plan for me than to let me die from the devil's stronghold. He knew that my passion and life dream was to be the mother that my son desperately deserved, and I needed to be that mother again. That is when God opened the path and led me to Adult and Teen Challenge. I had been raised Catholic all my life, but I knew nothing about a relationship with God or what this program was when I got here. Now, I've learned about who God is. I've read the Bible four times in this year. Um, and I'm learning that the word and the truth we receive when we accept him into our lives. God has been there with me the whole time I felt alone and stuck in my addiction, just waiting for me to reach out to him. He is the God of healing. Miraculously, I did not have to have the open heart surgery to replace the valves the staph infection had put holes in after a lengthy hospital stay. <laughs> my body also cured itself of the hep C. I now only have the antibodies for it, but I will never be able to spread it. And little did I know that that was God performing miracles. God is the God of faithfulness through trials and tribulations. After eight months of being an adult and teen challenge, I found myself facing two federal indictments among many other state and city warrants. I turned myself into the Billings Jail for the full extrajudicial warrant the FBI had put out for my arrest, and the judge let me out on pretrial supervision, released back to the program. I changed my plea in June of last year, and I was the first one in Missoula to be accepted to the federal drug court. <laughs> Upon completion of the drug court program, all my federal charges will be dropped from my record with prejudice, so I can never be charged for that crime. Again, only by the grace and mercy of our faithful Lord and Savior did I get this chance to not spend the next 10 years in the federal prison and get a chance to be Missoula's first success story in the federal drug court. 
Above all, God is the God of restoration. I now get my son every weekend. <laughs> yes. Um, when I get a house, I'll have him back full time after six months, after not having him for five years. Um, my family is the most supportive they've ever been. I have a great relationship with my dad now, my mom, my step parents, the whole family all around. It's amazing. Um, I also get to go meet my sister's baby <laughs> next week. <laughs> Um, God is helping to guide my path through each step of this program. I graduated the program, and I am on my six and a half months of my internship. And I came to Adult and Teen Challenge, a broken and lost mess that I thought would be anything, would never be anything more than homeless, law-breaking drug addict. That would be forever unforgiven. But the minute I walked through the doors of Adult and Teen Challenge and I accepted Jesus Christ in my life, I've learned I am a new creation, forgiven and perfectly and wonderfully made. I finally found the missing piece I'd been searching for my whole life. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, Who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth? And now I know God does. That is nothing short of miraculous right there, what you heard this morning, right? So powerful. I am so thankful that River of Life is such a sponsor, a partner, and more than anything, a family to Adult and Teen Challenge. Pastor Jason and Shannon go in every month and lead chapel with the ladies. We have our women's group who goes in every month and they just love on these ladies. And the ladies come and they, they serve with us. And to me, that is so powerful to see them just be, become part of who we are here at River. And along with that, we're going to take a special offering today to help bless the dream that has been planted here at Adult and Teen Challenge. You can give um, online. You can, uh, we're going to pass the buckets here in a minute. But what I want you to think about as you give is that you're not just giving to a program. You're planting seeds. You're giving to life change like we heard to this morning. So with that, we're going to have the ushers come forward, and I'm going to pray over this offering, and then Jamie's going to take us home, okay? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that you've laid before us to plant the seeds here of what is happening at Adult and Teen Challenge, this life-changing program that women are coming in broken, but they are coming out of it disciples of you. We thank you that we get the opportunity to walk alongside these women in their journeys. So take this offering and double it, multiply it, Lord, and make it stretch into life-changing opportunities. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. In 1958, David Wilkerson traveled to New York City to preach the gospel to teenagers. My name is Stephanie, and I'm from Brownsville. Hi, my name is Adam. My name is Jason. My name is Joseph. Faustino. Amanda. I was addicted to heroin and meth. Drug of choice was opiates in general. Bulimia, and then I masked that with severe alcohol. Meth and heroin. Addiction was like walking through hell. The darkest time in my life. It's very hard and it's lonely. Chaos everywhere, depression all the time, and anger 24 seven. My whole family had abandoned me because of all of the pain and suffering I'd caused. And I really had no drive or no hope or just no purpose of living. I viewed myself as um, a junkie. I saw myself as worthless. I saw myself as um, I deserved to live under that bridge. The Adult and Teen Challenge program for me was, was a place of peace, a place where I could finally find out who I was, who I was intended to be, and who honestly God created me to be. The program was easy for me to be in, but it required change and that was the hard part for me. It was difficult, but it was worth it. No pun intended, it's challenging. It's definitely a beautiful uh, process, but it's in no terms easy. The hardest year ever, but the best. I found who I was without, without drugs, without alcohol, without an eating disorder. I learned that I'm chosen, that I'm accepted, that I'm loved. God is a God of forgiveness, of mercy, of grace. I found freedom from the chains that I had worn my entire life. And I learned that my past does not define me. My identity now and 
forever is I'm a child of God. I look to his word and the truth and not to the lies of the enemy. Honestly, it's all because of Jesus. Before, I was a dirtbag. The trust that people have for me now. Um, nobody trusted me before I came in this program. And now I'm responsible for a, a campus, um, men's lives. God has entrusted me with a lot. And um, 12 years ago, that would not have been the case. Sponsorship was an anchor in this wild program. The sponsorship program is, is designed to help people get through the program that can't financially afford it. It helps students know that there is someone out there who cares about them and is praying for them. It was humbling, but it was also, I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why somebody who didn't know me would want to pray for me. It was amazing because I had burnt a lot of bridges in my past and I didn't think anybody cared enough to pray for me or want me to do better. And having a sponsor, I saw that there are people that cared. I've seen guys who were on the brink of the edge, about to leave, and they received a letter from their sponsors, which gave them hope to stay another day. To any of those sponsors out there that are listening that may have sponsored me, I want to say thank you. I would like to say thank you to all of my sponsors. They, they all made a difference. There was days when when I wanted to give up and I wanted to quit. And I know it sounds cliche, but they sent that letter and they listened to God's voice and told me exactly what I needed to hear in that moment that kept me, kept me going, kept me focused on the bigger picture and staying. They help uh, give that hope to somebody that doesn't have hope. You make it possible for people like me. Thank you to all of our current sponsors. You guys keep this program up and operational, so we can't thank you enough. If you're considering on sponsoring a student, it can help change a life. Help save a life. Help change a life. Put hope within reach. If student sponsorship is something that you're interested in, we have a table in the back and the ladies will be back there and happy to answer any questions that you might have. But before we leave, I want to just take a moment and have a conversation about a common theme that you heard in those testimonies. And the truth is, is that there's 14 others sitting here that have just as strong and amazing testimonies as well. And what we heard was brokenness and being lost and feeling like a burden and like your family didn't care about you, and that you're alone and that you're at the bottom. And as Lindsay so gingerly says it, but God... And isn't that the truth? One of my favorite things about our program is, is about week two. They, about week two, they're more awake. Their eyes are back. They can hold a conversation with you. And they can see that maybe they can make it through what they just came through. They made it through detox. They're, they're with us. And that hopelessness that they feel though still maybe there, is starting to fade. And then as the months go on, it just sheds and it's a beautiful transformation. Every day we, you and I, witness God's miracles and working power, victories that we celebrate and then life moves on and so we glance over it. Prayers that we once prayed that we're now living out, miracle after miracle, and yet we can find ourselves paralyzed by fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the unqualified, fear of the, yeah, but what if they find out about who I really am? Fear of doubt, what if I'm the one that Jesus cannot heal? What if I'm the one person that can't break free from these strongholds and these chains of addiction and all of the other things that hold us down? What if... We, our individuals, and sometimes the enemy, Seth, Pastor Seth made a point yesterday, which I absolutely love. It's not always the enemy that's doing things. It is sometimes our own flesh. And then also it is God saying, let me work on this. Like, it's not always the enemy, you know? It's God like, hey, I'm doing this for this reason. You won't see it maybe for five years, but I promise you it's there, right? But sometimes our lies that we allow to be told to us can hold us back from greatness and from victory in a relationship with Jesus. So here for a minute, I'd like to take a look at Mark 2, 1 through 5, the story where Jesus heals the paralyzed man. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. 
Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on the mat right down in front of Jesus, and seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. You want to talk about some faith. Like, these women have faith. They come through our doors. They know nothing about us. Most of them don't know Jesus. They walk through the doors and they're like, okay, I, I guess I've tried some other things, so let's give this a shot. But those of us that maybe aren't struggling in that area, could you get up on a roof to dig through to get to Jesus to get what you needed? Could you do that? Do you have the faith to get you up there? They could not get this man to Jesus because of the crowd, but that didn't stop him. They didn't say, oh yeah, you're right. Let's just go home. Let's go do something else, right? They had a, this, this man, this paralyzed gentleman had a community around him that said, no, we are not turning back. We are going to the one that can heal. We're going to get you there. And Jesus says, my child, your sins are forgiven. The people that were there, the religious men that were there in, in the room, they, they, they don't believe Jesus because at this point, God's the only one that can heal. And so they question him. And so then Jesus tells the man, well, pick up your mat and go, go home. And so the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out. How many of us are sitting in the room this morning that have been forgiven of something and yet we still sit? When the Lord is saying, you are forgiven, jump up and go home, you stay sitting because of our own unbelief, our own fear that paralyzes us to the point where we're like, I, I can't do this. God, I hear you, I, I, I hear you, but I don't actually know if I believe that. I don't actually know if, if, if that's actually going to happen to me. This past week, our women got to take two days and go to Camp Bighorn, who we partner with um, every year. And they got to go through their ropes course. And one of the staff members came back and she was telling me about how many good breakthroughs and all of the awesome stories that were happening. And one of them really stuck out to me. They were harnessed and they were going through the ropes course. And at the time, the woman that was connected came off of the wire and was so frightened that she was holding on so tight to the ropes that it was burning her hands. And the staff member over here, I don't actually know where she was, I wasn't there. And a student that was down below said, let go, your harness will catch you. You're already connected, let, let go. And I was reminded of how the Lord must be with us. Would you just let go? I'm already here. I've already got you. Like you are fully enveloped in my love and in my goodness and in my mercy and my forgiveness. I've already got you. Will you just let go? We just let go. And in that moment through the community of the staff member and this other student that were reminding this woman like, hey, you're good. You're safe. The harness has got you. She continued on, and not only did she continue on in that moment, she finished the entire ropes course, which is more than I could ever say I could do, so good on her. We hold on so tight to things because who am I without that? Who am I without the chaos? Who am I without the drama, without the, the I, you know, my hurt and my pain and my suffering? Who am I if I actually release and believe that the Lord can do that? But we see in his word that he did and he does. So we have to believe. God's telling us. I thought, you know, these, these four men... They, they, they knew we have to get this man to Jesus, no matter what, no matter the doors, the doors blocked, the crowd's too big. We're going to figure out another way. I just want you to think for a minute of a roof. Put yourself there. Could you dig through the roof to get to Jesus? I mean, I, I, I sit there and think, well, I'd for sure break all my nails. And I don't know if I'd have the gumption to keep going. And, but if I knew that the Lord was in there and just by being in his presence, I could be healed. Could I keep going in my power? Absolutely not. 
but the power that dwells inside of me because of the Holy Spirit, you better believe it. You better believe it. I know there are a lot of you in here that have had your heart broken. You're dealing with grief and fear and loss, financial burdens. The world we're living in is is chaotic at best. And I know that it probably seems maybe like the door's too crowded, the roof's too tall. I just don't really think I can do this. Like I, I hear you and I hear these testimonies and they're super good, but I'm really not that far gone. And I really, I really don't have that kind of story. And so I'll just continue to go along my day and my week. And then I'll come to church on Sundays or Saturday nights and, and hear the worship team and hear Pastor Jason preach. And then I'll go about my, the rest of my day because it doesn't really matter, but it does. It does matter when you fully surrender your life to Christ. I promise you what you think you will miss, you will no longer. He just puts things in your life that are just different and you don't miss it. There might be moments, but it is not your ultimate thing. We have some good news. You don't have to, if the door is blocked, get up on the roof. There's another way. Go to the Lord. Go to him. On the days when that voice inside of your head that gets too loud, that tells you you're a burden and nobody cares about you and this is too hard and I can't do this anymore. On those days, find a way, make a way, go to the roof, rip it off and get to the Lord. And if you can't do it alone, do you have a community around you that's going to go with you? Do you have a community that's gonna say, yeah, we're not gonna go walk away and build a team and have a pity party, but we're actually gonna get up on that roof. We're gonna dig deeper than we've ever dug before because we know that Christ is there and he has what I need in the moment. You have to silence it. Today, you might need to lay something down. Maybe it is that self-doubt, that unbelief, that voice from a family member your own voice, something from your your past that just continues to kind of hold you in this bondage. Today, you might need to lay that down. And then you might need to lay it down again tomorrow. And for some of us, we have to lay it down within like five minutes because we tend to hold, we like let it go. And then we're like, actually, I'm going to keep that for a minute because I don't know who I am without it. The Lord doesn't tell you that there's there's a time when you can't do it anymore. Seven times seven, you forgive. You just keep going. And he's like, come on back. I'm here. I'm waiting for you. Release your hands and allow the harness to catch you. Allow the Lord to do what he's telling you. He's already got you. The women you heard from today and the others in the program are learning to release and let God. They are learning to get to Jesus no matter what. And some days are easy and some days are hard because we are our, sometimes our own worst enemies. But they're learning who they are in Christ Jesus, what their, who their identity is in Christ. They are learning they are a child of the most high and so are you. In James 1.12, anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate For such persons loyally in love with God, the reward is life and more. It's easy to give up. It's easy to run back to what you know. Maybe an abusive relationship, because that's the only love you think you deserve. Maybe an addiction of some sort that you don't, maybe isn't as focused on our eyes as drugs and alcohol. There's a lot of addictions these days. It's easier to go back and gossip about the person that you're frustrated with instead of just having a conversation and saying, hey, I heard it this way. Is that actually what you meant? And I can guarantee nine times out of 10, it wasn't. It's through the filter of your feelings. And can I tell you, your feelings are not fact, turns out. Those four men were faced with a crowd where they could not get to Jesus and yet they persevered. They got on the roof, they ripped it off, they lowered that man, and Jesus said, my child, your sins are forgiven. 
Maybe there's some of you in the room this morning that you don't know the relationship I'm talking about. You don't know the Jesus that is there for you in your hardest of hearts and in your glory of glory. Maybe you don't know what it looks like to, to really not hold on so tightly. As a recovering control freak, some days I'm better than others, Cameron, don't say anything. I feel good when I'm like, you know what, God, you've got that. I'm not gonna spend the next 15 hours worrying about something because I already know you've already gone before me, behind me, you're beside me and you're all around me. I've already know you've done that. So I'm gonna release that, but maybe you don't know this Jesus. So I'm gonna ask everybody in the room to close your eyes. Nobody's gonna be looking around. Maybe this is a place in your life where you have thought about it or maybe you've done this, but you're not really walking this path. Maybe you come into church on Sunday mornings or Saturday evenings and you're wearing what we call church mask. You're just making it through. You're going through the motions to go through the motions. But there is something, there is someone better and waiting for you to just lay it all down. So with every eye closed, I'm just going to ask if this is, if you've not ever entered into a relationship with Jesus and this is something you would like to do this morning, just raise your hand, catch my eye. I'm not gonna call you forward. I'm just gonna pray with you right here. I see you back there. I see you. Thank you. Anyone else just say, I just want, I want that. I want to not live in my muck and the yuck anymore. I want to live fully in Jesus. I see you. I got you. What a beautiful moment. God is so good. He's so good. I'm going to have everybody, whether you raise your hand or not, I'm going to have everybody repeat this with me. This is a beautiful time right now. Dear Lord, please forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you the rest of this life. Amen. Man, what a beautiful morning. Thank you so much for coming out to hear about Adult and Teen Challenge and what God is doing in this miraculous program and through these amazing strong women. The worship team's gonna worship a little bit longer and we've got prayer teams down here. If you just feel like you need some prayer for anything, it doesn't matter, come on down. The altars are open. This is your time and your space, don't rush. Allow the Lord to speak to you and hold you where you're at. Father, right now, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the work that you did on the cross, Lord, and for what you're doing here today, Lord God. Father, we thank you for Adult and Teen Challenge and programs like it, Lord, that say it doesn't matter how messy you are, come on in, because that is what Christ says to us every day. Lord God, we thank you for a church like River of Life that says, come on in, we'll love on you and we'll support you, God. God, I thank you for these people. I pray blessings over them, Lord. I pray blessings upon blessings upon blessings in their situations that are unspoken, God. The prayers that are not spoken because they have fear of being sought, caught, Lord God. Lord, you are so good, Lord. And so right now in this moment, Lord, I just pray that this can just be a time of worship and praise and thanksgiving because you deserve it. God, you deserve all of us and all that we have to give you, Lord. Jesus, I thank you for this morning, Lord, and we pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen.